John List was a very successful accountant who quickly moved up the corporate ladder in large companies like Xerox. In 1965, he became the vice president and comptroller at a local bank in Westfield, New Jersey. List lived in an 18-room mansion with his wife, mother, and three children. After some time, he was let go from his bank job but never told his family. Every day he left the house under the guise of going to work, but instead was desperately trying to find employment. Finally, after months of failing and massive amounts of debt piling up, he snapped. On a day in 1971, using a 9mm handgun he purchased as a World War II souvenir, he murdered his family by shooting them each in the back of the head. List was a neat freak, so he proceeded to place the bodies in the living room and scrub the house clean. He then told the neighbors in the kids' school the family was going away for a few weeks to stay with his wife's sick mother. He cashed out his mother's savings bonds, put a hold on the family's mail, and vanished. A month later, neighbors became suspicious, and the local police investigated the house where they found the bodies. They searched the house but found that List had taken every family photo and cut himself out of it. This was so the police wouldn't have anything to use on the wanted posters. Years went by and List was never found. Brian Garfield was a writer who lived in New Jersey when all this happened. The idea of what happened was terrifying, and he thought it would make for an excellent story. It was the mid-70s, and slasher films weren't a thing yet, so for Garfield, this was something new. He consulted with crime fiction author Donald Westlake, who adapted the story to a screenplay. For almost ten years, they shopped it around, but no one was interested. Finally, one day, it came across the desk of producer Jay Benson. Benson read the screenplay because he was a big fan of Westlake's mystery novels. He loved the idea and thought it would make a great film. ITC was a production company that up to this point had done mostly TV production, like The Muppet Show, as well as the occasional movie, like On Golden Pond, picked up the screenplay. They liked that it was a very non-traditional film. There was no real hero or heroine, and the character of the stepfather was incredibly interesting. They sent the script to director Joe Rubin, who just finished working on Dreamscape. He was immediately drawn to the film because he has a fascination with abnormal family movies. It was now 1985, and slasher films like Friday the 13th, Halloween, and A Nightmare on Elm Street were increasing in popularity. Noting this trend, Rubin was afraid the studio had won a slasher and tried to drop the film. He spoke to the studio, who not only assured him that they didn't want a slasher, but let him know that he'd have the creative freedom to make the film that he wanted to make. After that, he spent the next several weeks with the writer to fine-tune the script. The budget they had for the film was low. They had numerous people audition for Jerry Blake, but unanimously agreed the role should go to a then-unknown Terry O'Quinn. When he read for the role, he blew them all away. Joel Sholin, who was in a few movies already, like DC Cab, and that was then This Is Now, jumped at the chance for a leading role. Westlake based the character of Stephanie after his own stepdaughter. Rubin specifically hired Shelley Hack off her performance in one of his all-time favorite movies, The King of Comedy. They hired Patrick Moraz, the keyboardist from Yes and the Moody Blues, to do the score. The location in the script was Seattle, but they were filming in Vancouver. They did their best to make the film look all-American, despite being in Canada. They wanted that Norman Rockwell feel. Filming ran from October to November because they wanted it to take place in the fall. For the opening, they had crew members up in the trees shaking the branches so the leaves would fall into frame. They had a few different houses in the film. Ruben said they chose them because on the exterior, it looked like the kind of house where nothing bad could ever happen. They're worried about the brutal reveal in the beginning. When Jerry walks downstairs, you see the chaos, and it ends on a dead kid. They decide to keep it in to show just how unhinged the character was. When Jerry walks away, they wanted to have him whistle the song, The Way We Were. Unfortunately, they couldn't afford the rights to be able to whistle the song, so they used Camp Town Races, a public domain song. Since they were filming in Vancouver, they couldn't afford to bring in any more American actors. So for the smaller parts, they went with local Canadian actors. Almost the entire film was shot on location. The main house was actually a few different houses depending on the room, or in the case of the basement fight, the outside was one location, and the inside by the stairs was another. The house for sale was an empty house they were able to borrow for the film. One of the stairwells was a set, and the attic was a set. The weather during the shoot was miserable. It was cold, and it rained almost the entire time, except for the time it snowed. They were supposed to film in the town that day, but quickly had to get plows to clear the snow, and the crew to shovel and clear any trace of snow. When Stephanie and her boyfriend are riding the scooter, it was freezing, and the actors were miserable. The character of Jim, the brother hot on Jerry's tail, was an intentional red herring. In other movies, a character like him would show up just in time to save the day. However, in this, Jim shows up and is promptly killed. While the script retained elements of List, such as him murdering his family and creating a new identity, they changed other aspects. He kept his idiosyncrasies like OCD and compulsion for neatness and order. 
In an early draft, they had flashbacks to Jerry being beaten as a child. They removed it because they thought it was scarier to not know what brought him to this point. Throughout the film, Jerry was either wearing red or had something red nearby. To show when Jerry snaps, they have him half in light and half in darkness. The scene where Jerry kills the guy with the 2x4 was originally much gorier. They decided to dial it back because they didn't want the film to be compared to a slasher. When everything starts to unravel and Jerry says, Wait a minute. Who am I here? That went over so well, they used it for the marketing. Ruben's a big fan of Hitchcock, so the scene with the birds was an homage to the birds. The replaced photo Stephanie gets was a member of the crew. After 40 days, the film wrapped. The movie was released on June 5th, 1987. Most critics liked it, but the film still underperformed, making only $2.4 million in its run. Notorious horror hater Roger Ebert gave the film 2.5 stars and lambasted the violence in the film, even though by comparison to other horror films at the time, the violence was relatively tame. The opening is probably the worst part, and that's because of the dead kid. Ruben said he thinks that by not showing as much and having a few intensely brutal moments, it gives the appearance that the film is more violent than it is. The film became a minor cult hit on video, and a sequel was made in 1989. O'Quinn was the only one to return. While Ruben worked hard on the original to not make it into a slasher, the sequel veered right into it. Stepfather 2 did well enough to warrant another sequel, but this time O'Quinn left, and the role was picked up by Robert Whiteman. This one went direct to video. After this, Jill Sholin became a screen queen, doing numerous horror films like Popcorn, The Phantom of the Opera, and Curse 2 The Bite. She was briefly engaged to Brad Pitt after they met in cutting class. O'Quinn went on to do tons of TV and movies, with his biggest role being John Locke on the show Lost. After The Stepfather, Ruben continued to do his warped family movies, like Sleeping with the Enemy, The Good Son, and The Forgotten. The original was remade in 2009 and received generally poor reviews, mostly because it ramped up the violence while dumping the psychological aspects. The Stepfather is an outstanding horror thriller. The unusual nature of the film, punctuated by O'Quinn's amazing performance, helps this to stand out amongst many of the other genre films of the time. While O'Quinn definitely steals the show, it doesn't completely overshadow the performances of Sholin and Hack. They were believable as the rebellious daughter and the emotional mother. O'Quinn played Jerry with a mechanical nature. Everything he does is what he thinks he's supposed to do. He's acting all the time to appear like the perfect husband he thinks he is. While we know Jerry killed one family and would have killed another, it's very possible he may have killed before. He seemed to have his disguises and methods down pretty well, so it stands to reason that this could have been his fourth or fifth family for all we know. Reuben liked the character of Jerry Blake, the stepfather, because he felt he was a sympathetic villain. He loves the idea of family, but can't handle the reality. Sholin's done numerous movies and said this was one of her favorite roles. Ruben didn't want anything to do with the sequels, because as far as he was concerned, Blake was dead at the end of the film. John List was eventually caught in 1989. He'd been living with a new family and new identity for nearly 18 years. He'd moved from New Jersey to Michigan to Colorado and settled in Denver. He was using the name of a college classmate, Robert Clark. He was caught because of the show America's Most Wanted. In the episode, they had a forensic pathologist recreate what they thought List would look like at the time. He created a bust which looked exactly like List. A neighbor saw the broadcast and notified the police. List was arrested and convicted of five counts of first-degree murder. He spent the remainder of his life in prison until dying of pneumonia in 2008 at the age of 82. Beyond the stepfather, John List also inspired another great cinematic villain. Kaiser Soze, from The Usual Suspects. While List wasn't an international crime boss, he did kill his entire family and get away with it for 18 years. He remarried in 1985 and was arrested in 1989. So for at least four years, his wife was unaware that she was in the presence of true evil. That's scarier than fiction. Go to jail. This girl is 16 years old. So am I. Jerry, 